act together now. Here we go. Nothing. Oh, he had us down. Okay. All right, we're going to continue on with our seminar. Hopefully you had time to visit with exhibitors and gather information about specific services available within the St. Louis community. My name is Kelsey Murick. I am the Concussion and Vestibular Program Manager with SSM Health Physical Therapy. It is now time for the International Concussion Consensus Guidelines session. My introduction assignment is quite easy. Please welcome back Dr. Mark Halstead. Okay. I get the twofer. Um, so before um, the first presentation where they outlined all the um, guidelines and that were out there, how many of you have heard of the Berlin Report for Concussions? Now, keep your hands up. How many of you have actually read through the full Berlin Report? Be honest. All right. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today, so, so there have been five consensus guidelines that have come out. The first one starting in 2001. They're about every four years or so that they hold these. And then they publish um, basically the current state of knowledge about concussions. And if you look at the first one in Berlin and you look at it now and you look at them in between, there has been an evolution of stuff that's gone on. So, so a lot of the things that we see actually that are, that are told to patients and talked about and how people practice are the 2001 stuff. So, so again, this is evolving. So what we're going to do is, and one of the things I liked about what they did with the Berlin report is they, they talked about the 11 R's related to concussion. So I'm just going to go through the 11 R's with you um, so we can be all up to speed on things. So it was published in May last year. Um, they had other things associated with this. So they published the SCAT-5, the Child SCAT-5, which are the sport concussion assessment tools. And then they also uh, published what's called the concussion recognition tools. So what those are is the SCAT-5 and then the Child SCAT-5. Those are assessments that are, are kind of how you do an assessment on someone on the sidelines. Um, as an example, concussion recognition tools are meant for non-healthcare professionals as a way to help you recognize whether a concussion may have occurred. It doesn't go through all the detailed assessments, but at least goes through some basic stuff as far as warning signs and things that you could give to uh, someone who is not medically trained. So um, as far as helping to recognize it, which is why they're called the concussion recognition tools. Those are all freely downloadable off of the internet. Uh, these were published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So when you look at some of the um, things that I had written out on there. There's the British version of spelling, so it's not that I don't know how to spell, it's just they're the British version uh, as far as how they uh, write some of the words. Um, and what they also had with this is several systematic reviews, so if you're not familiar with a systematic review, basically they ask a question, they look through all the research, and then try and come up with an answer based on the current research that's out there to help guide us in our decision making and what the current knowledge is. Um, and like I said, these are, these are free to download uh, through the British Journal of Sports Medicine site. Same thing with the, the tools you can download and print out free of charge. So let's start off with these 11 R's. So the first one, and, and these are going to kind of go through a sequence of like seeing the concussion and then what do we do managing it. So the first is recognizing it. So what they did is the definition that was discussed before, they added some things to that. So the first of that being is that the clinical signs and symptoms cannot be explained by drug alcohol or medication use, because again, some of those things in a concussion could cloud uh, the picture, or other injuries, such as a cervical injury, so a neck injury, or per a peripheral vestibular dysfunction, so stuff we talked about before, uh, and other comorbidity. So that's psychological factors that coexist with clinical conditions, so someone who has a migraine headache disorder already. We can't explain their headache because of that migraine. Or they're depressed, so we can't explain their symptoms because of their underlying depression. So, so it adds those things in there, recognizing that there are coexisting problems that can mimic or mirror concussion symptoms. Um, it also talked about the use of helmet-based or other sensor systems to clinically diagnose or assess a concussion cannot be supported at this time. So the ones that are out there are just not ready for prime time yet. So if you're thinking about or looking into buying some of these new helmets, because I know Rydell has one now with these helmet sensor systems, 
save your money right now, okay? Because they're not ready for prime time and they probably will cause you more headaches than they will cause you, and not headaches from concussions, but just headaches in general, um, uh, of trying to use those and figure out what all this means. And the reason why they're not very helpful right now is there's still no established hit level that determines a concussion. So they've done thousands and thousands and thousands of hits with very elaborate systems to determine what G-force it takes to produce a concussion. And there's no consistency to that at all. You can have a 100 G-force hit and not get a concussion, and you can have a, a 40 G-force hit and get a concussion. So, so again, these typically are looking at levels of forces to the, the head as far as determining, do you need to look at this person? But there's, like I said, no set criteria. Where do we set that level? And again, you'll get a lot of false negatives and a lot of assessments that you're going to need to do on people that may not mean anything. And then it talks about the SCAT being useful immediately after the injury and helpful uh, in differentiating a uh, concussed athlete versus a non-concussed athlete, but it doesn't really help as much three or five days after the injury. So, so repeating doing the SCAT assessment on someone over and over and over again is probably not very helpful. So a lot of these kids I see in the office after three or five days, and I don't do a full SCAT assessment on these kids because, again, it doesn't help me. I'm not, they're already in my office because they've been diagnosed or thought to have a concussion. I'm not going to go through that full assessment on that person. I do parts of it. Because, um, again, it's not going to help me determine uh, things one way or the other. Um, but it does talk about the symptom checklist, however, does demonstrate some clinical utility in tracking recovery. So the 22 item symptom checklist, using those to assess someone's recovery over time can be helpful. The next R is remove. So again, when a concussion is suspected, the athlete should be removed from the sporting environment and a multimodal assessment, so that means not just using one tool to assess a concussion, should be uh, conducted in a standardized, there's your British version, uh, fashion, and they use the example of the SCAT-5. And this is a big hit and a knock on probably wrestling in particular. Um, sporting bodies should allow adequate time to conduct this evaluation. Okay, so for example, completing the SCAT alone typically takes 10 minutes. The wrestling assessment is not a 10 minute assessment for an injury timeout. So, so again, th they looked at that and looked at other teams and other sports uh, and addressing that because um, again, we really need to give someone adequate time to assess for the injury. And unfortunately, the way a lot of teams and sports are set up right now, there's just not adequate enough time that's allowed or given to do that assessment. And then the final determination regarding the diagnosis of a concussion uh, or fitness to play is a medical decision based on clinical judgment, okay? Not someone on Twitter, okay? Um, and so, so, again, this is one of those things that we see a lot is, you know, people will second guess, oh, we saw this on TV, that person had a concussion. There are a lot of things that go into that than what's seen on TV, okay, as far as what goes on as far as the decision to play and what may have caused that person's um, symptoms or their problems. So, so again, it's a medical decision. It's not, there's one test I can do on someone and I've diagnosed a concussion, okay? It still comes down to a clinical judgment thing of a person saying, did this person have a concussion or not? Um, Reevaluate is the next R. So, so post-injury neuropsychological testing, that's what the NP, so that's things like impact, is not required for all athletes. That's the consensus statement, okay? It says also that post-injury neuropsych testing like impact may be used to assist return to play decisions and is typically performed when an athlete is asymptomatic, so they're not having their symptoms anymore. There's not a great utility of using those tests in someone who's still having symptoms. It's not going to change what we're going to do with that person. They don't help us determine how do you go back into school. They don't determine for us how long do we expect this person to be out. It doesn't tell us, hey, this kid needs this accommodation in school. So, so again, we wait until their, their symptoms are cleared if we're going to use those and see if they have returned back to their baseline level of function if we're using baseline testing, which to me is the ideal thing. Comparing it to a, a, a standardized norm is probably not the ideal. And that's just my own editorializing. Um, advanced neuroimaging, so that's things more than just CAT scans or MRIs. So these are special tests, functional MRIs, spec scanning, things like that. Uh, fluid biomarkers, so that's some blood test or some other fluid test that we do to try and assess for concussion. You know, they, there's been stuff I've seen in the, the, um, uh, the general press recently as far as a spit test, as far as you spit and then you can determine from their spit certain levels of things that determine if you have a concussion. It's not something that you should do, nor is it something that's ready. Um, uh, and so uh, things like that, genetic testing are important research tools, so again, they're still being looked at but they require further validation to determine if their clinical utility is helpful for the evaluation of a concussion. So, so those advanced testing, those things are still for us just research things. They're not stuff that we should be doing and utilizing 
um, on all of our athletes. But you know, having worked with the Rams in the past when they were here, uh, that was a common question is, how come you guys just don't have a blood test to tell me if I have a concussion or not? I go, we'd love to have that, but we don't. Um, and then you guys don't let us draw your blood anyways. And so, uh, and so, so then, then that's another story. So, so how are we going to do that? Um, it's amazing how players can take gigantic hits game after game, but they get scared by a needle um, uh, as far as taking blood. Um, the next R is rest. So after a brief period of rest during the acute phase, and that's listed as 24 to 48 hours after their injury, patients can be encouraged to become gradually and progressively more active while staying below their cognitive and physical symptom exacerbation thresholds. So again, the activity level should not bring on or worsen their symptoms. So, so again, we're letting them do things. We're just not letting them do their normal level of stuff. Um, and it's reasonable at, for athletes to avoid vigorous exertion while they are recovering. The exact amount and duration of rest is not yet well defined in the literature and requires further study. So again, that's, that's the big bugaboo. There's a sweet spot probably there for most athletes. We just haven't figured out how to determine where that athlete's sweet spot is to start really pushing them further. Okay, it's the same thing like rehabbing a musculoskeletal injury. There's a sweet spot where you can really start to push them to get their recovery better. We just haven't figured that out yet for, for the brain. Uh, rehab uh, is the next R. So, so the literature has not evaluated early interventions as most individuals recover in 10 to 14 days. So, so us doing any sort of rehab intervention, so working on their neck, working on their vestibular system, working on their ocular motor system, none of those have been looked at in the early period. Uh, so we can't really say and make any conclusions on that. A variety of treatments may be required for ongoing or persistent symptoms and impairments following the injury. So the data supports intervention using, including psychological, cervical, and vestibular rehab. So one thing I do try and get kids early on going uh, is if they have an associated neck muscle strain with their concussion of rehabbing that soon. And so if the kid tells me, my headaches are all back here, doc, they hurt here all the time. It hurts when I move, okay? That's a kid and they have soreness along the neck muscles. I'm gonna get that kid going on rehab as soon as I can because the neck can generate a lot of their symptoms and a lot of their headaches that they have troubles with. And if I don't address that, just like if a person came into my uh, office for a whiplash injury from a car accident, and I tell them, yeah, your neck will get better, eh, probably it won't. Okay, that's why you see these people have troubles with their neck for long periods of time after those. They just never had a rehab. Okay? So, so just like any other muscular injury you get, if you strain your neck muscles, which is very common with a concussion because most of them are whiplash effects, we want to treat that. Okay, because that is an individual treatable injury with their concussion that we can help get them better with uh, and may help dramatically with their symptoms. So in addition, closely monitored active rehab programs, uh, again, another British spelling, uh, involved controlled, or involving controlled sub-symptom thresholds, so what we talked about before, doing some activity below a certain threshold, which is why I just only prescribe this, the brisk walking for my kids and nothing more than that, because I don't have the closely monitor where I can put a heart rate monitor on them and see where they're exerting at. Um, and so I'm not gonna test them further than that when they're on their own of doing sub-symptom thresholds, sub-maximal exercise have been shown to be safe and maybe benefit in facilitating recovery. So if a kid that may be really struggling, I may get them in a supervised program for that, but again, I wanna let them do some level of light physical exertion um, early on after their injury. Um, refer is the next R. So the Berlin, Berlin expert con consen consensus is to use uh, the use of the term Persistent symptoms following sports-related concussion should reflect the failure of normal clinical recovery. So getting rid of that post-concussive syndrome diagnosis, we just use persistent symptoms instead. Um, and that is symptoms that persist beyond the expected time frames of recovery. So that's as was mentioned before, 10 to 14 days in adults and greater than four weeks in kids. So if they have them belong past that, then they're a concussion with persistent symptoms. Are you using an age or like puberty for adults and uh, 18 and below, 18 is the cutoff typically for adults and child or children for these definitions. Persistent symptoms does not reflect a single pathophysiological entity, but describes a constellation of nonspecific post-traumatic symptoms. So that could be, again, they may have some vague thing that's going on that has nothing to do with their concussion. They're reporting that. It may be linked to a coexisting problem. So again, attention deficit disorder as an example. So when we fill out symptom checklists, we need to make sure that if a kid who has attention deficit disorder is filling out, I have difficulty concentrating at a level of three, and they always put that, that's their only thing, you gotta ask them, well, is this there normally for you? Is this your level of what you perform at? Because if I expect them to get it a zero at all things, there are people that are not gonna get to zeros in all their things, okay? 
So, so again, we have to ask about those things specifically when we're going through symptom checklists. We can't just assume everybody's gonna get to a zero, because right now, if I gave you all a symptom checklist and I had you fill it out right now, you will not all have zeros, okay? I will write some things on my symptom checklist right now, things that I have in experiencing right now. So, so again, it's one of those things that, that we have to ask about those. So, so when I use symptom checklists, I don't just follow the numbers and just say, oh, your headache's a five today. Well, when was your headache and how long did it last? Because a headache that's five minutes out of the entire day at a level of five compared to a kid who has a five headache that's there all day long constantly, I'm gonna take care of that kid completely differently and recommend different things for them. So we have to look into those things a little bit further. And that's again, we can't just look at the numbers, so to speak. Um, and so, and they don't necessarily reflect the ongoing physiologic injury to the brain. So it's thought that most people, the, the actual injury of the concussion, what goes on in the brain, ends within a few weeks after that person's concussion, okay? So, so stuff that's lasting longer than that, the hard part is attributing that to the concussion itself. There's probably other things that are going on that are leading them to have their symptoms. And then again, that could be coexisting or developing depression or anxiety. It could be a sleep disorder. It could be the neck injury. It could be that they have the vestibular ocular motor dysfunction. So that's why kids that have persistent symptoms, they probably really do need to get seen by a specialist who deals with this stuff all the time to sort those things out. Because if you can't figure it out and you're just saying, well, we'll just rest them some more, we'll rest them some more, we'll rest them some more, that kid is probably gonna take a very long time to get better because there's probably something that we can identify that we can treat with that person, especially in that prolonged period of recovery. Um, refer, so again, so there is preliminary evidence supporting the use of an individualized, symptom-limited aerobic exercise program in patients with persistent post-concussive symptoms, uh, so that persistent symptoms category associated with autonomic instability, so that's the ability of when they get up and they feel like they, they get dizzy or they get lightheaded when they get up quickly, or physical deconditioning. So, so again, exercise is beneficial for people that have long-term long, long -term symptoms, so we don't wanna just keep them resting um, from physical activity and do nothing. Um, a targeted physical therapy program in patients with cervical spine or vestibular dysfunction, support, the use, uh, evidence supports the use of that. And then a collaborative approach, including cognitive behavioral therapy, so that means being psychologists, psychiatrists, things like that, to deal with any persistent mood or behavioral issues. So, so that's really important, especially in the teenager who develops those issues. Because um, again, we already deal with mental health problems in our country very poorly. And if we don't take care of that in someone who's developing those problems with their concussion, that actually can make things more of a trouble for them. And then currently there's limited evidence to support the use of any medications for concussions. So I talked about melatonin. There's small amounts of things that support the use of melatonin. Just anecdotally using it in my office a fair amount, I do find that it helps. But other medicines, there really is not great um, uh, uh, research to show that it makes a difference. So even things like Tylenol and ibuprofen. So, so one of the things I stress with patients in the office for those, and I ask them, does it make a difference when you take the Tylenol or ibuprofen? The vast majority, again, just from experience, the vast majority will tell me it doesn't help. Or it takes their headache from a four to a three and a half. Okay, so, so one of the problems, if you utilize those medicines over and over again, you can actually develop headaches from taking those medicines over and over and over again. So just like anything else in medicine, if it's not working, I need to change my plan and switch and do something different. Um, so I don't mind them using those, but I don't keep using them if they're not helping them. And I don't expect it to because it's a functioning problem in the brain. It's not an inflammatory thing like that that's gonna usually help with taking those medications. But again, I'm not opposed to trying them. So recovery, the next R, so the strongest and most consistent predictor of slow recovery from a concussion is the severity of that person's initial symptoms on the first day or initial first day, a few days after the injury. So they've looked at tons and tons of stuff. Does this modify how long it takes you to get better? Does this modify how long it takes you to get better? There's tons of studies that show conflicting evidence. One will say, yes, it, it causes longer recovery. Another study will say, no, it doesn't. The only thing that's been shown over and over and over again is if you have a high symptom burden, so you fill out a symptom checklist and your symptom score is very high, you know, compared to a, a 10 and a total score compared to an 80, the person who's got the 80, their likelihood of having a longer and slower recovery is much higher. So, so that high symptom burden early on is the kids that you need to worry about. Um, moreover, recent literature suggests that the physiologic time of recovery may outlast the time for clinical recovery. So what that means in normal words is if you have a concussion, you may feel fine, but your brain may still be injured. Okay, and that's the hard part with this, is that there probably are people out there that we're letting go back to play and do things and they haven't fully healed their injury. But we do that with musculoskeletal injuries too, as they're feeling fine, their actual injury hasn't fully healed, but we're letting them participate again. So the question is, is that bad or not? We really don't know that answer yet. Um, and so the consequence of that is a yet unknown, 
But one possibility is that athletes may be exposed to additional risk by returning into play while there is ongoing brain dysfunction. So again, why you want to be more conservative with someone uh, after their concussion rather than being more cavalier and letting them go back to play right away. <clears throat> return to sport, the next R. The process of recovery and then return to sport participation after a concussion follows a graduated, graduated stepwise rehab strategy. So again, that's the typical five steps approach, uh, which is what we utilize in the state of Missouri uh, to get people back. Uh, reconsider, so the management of concussion in children requires special paradigms suitable for the developing child. So the, the thing that's my pet peeve about this, this particular consensus statement is they do like everything else with, with pediatrics is they talk about the college athlete and the professional athlete a lot, but then for kids, kids are different, treat them differently, but then they don't give any guidance to that. So, so we do have, um, there will be an updated statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics that I, uh, I was the initial author on in 27, 2010, and then we have another one coming out um, that's an update this fall that'll guide specifically kids and adults, or kids and adolescents for um, concussion. Um, <clears throat> residual effects, the next R. Clinicians need to be mindful of the potential for long-term problems such as cognitive impairment, depression, in the management of all athletes. However, there is much more to learn about the potential cause and effect relationships of repetitive head impact exposure and concussions. And so again, this is still a to be determined, to be continued. Uh, we certainly know that there are cases of athletes who have had long-term disability from their repetitive head injuries. There's no question that any repetitive injury to any area on your body is not good for your body. The question is we don't know where that lies. And so, so again, there's still more to learn. Um, one thing that I just bring up, and I, I should have actually put this because it was research that was published this year. So that what got a lot of attention this past year was the, the study that was done on the retired professional athletes with CTE, the NFL players, where 99% of the athletes that they study their brains of, which was 200 and some, had findings of CTE, so the long-term damage issue in the brain. The interesting thing about that study that did not get much attention, because that got all the headlines. If you have 99% of something, that's gonna get the headlines. If you looked at athletes that only played football, which this was mainly, a, it was a football study, only played football through high school, Three of 14 people who only played through high school had CTE. Not 99%, three of 14, that was 20%. And those that had it had the mildest form that you can get when you look at that person's brain. So again, there is a dose response here, people, okay? So, so the longer you play, the more hits you get, the more likely you're gonna develop these things, okay? So for the vast majority of kids that I take care of that are gonna be playing through high school, the odds of them having any of these issues or any of these findings on their brain, I should say, because we haven't even still figured out what that in the brain means for that person in their daily life, um, is probably much, well, it is much smaller than what you'd experience in the professional athlete. So, so again, we have to remember those things when we're looking at uh, patients and when we counsel patients too. Risk reduction. So the evidence examining the protective effect of helmets and reducing the risk of concussion is limited in many sports. So there's been lots of research now that show that really the helmets have not been very helpful. So, so I get the question again a lot about headgear for soccer, lacrosse, or things like that. If the helmet's not gonna protect, protect you from a concussion, your headgear is also not gonna protect you from concussion. Um, the strongest and most consistent uh, evidence evaluating policy um, and this has been looked at as body checking in youth high, ice hockey, so disallowing body checking under the age of 13. There's lots of uh, research to show that that's actually very helpful, reducing your likelihood of getting concussion, um, and that's the only thing that really actually has been shown from evidence evaluating policy related to changes. So no one's looked at policy for other sports and other activities. You know, we do know that you know, recently U.S. soccer made the recommendation of changing the ages when you can start to allow heading. Um, so we'll have to see, since that change has been made, does that make a difference uh, in the rates of concussion? Um, and that's kind of the R's. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about the SCAT-5. And for any of you that are familiar with the SCAT-5, if you haven't heard me talk about this since this has been updated, People are wondering, where was the SCAT 4? Because there was a SCAT 3 that we talked about for a long time, and now we're at SCAT 5. You didn't miss it, okay? It never existed. What they decided is because this was the fifth, the fifth meeting, and they had these statements come out almost on time with each other. Obviously, they were a year off, is that to be consistent, they wanted to have the number of the SCAT associated with the number of the meeting. So there will never be a SCAT 4. There will be a SCAT 6 next, and then a SCAT 7, and... SCAT 150 someday, probably. Um, so, so again, just so you know, that's why there's no SCAT 4. So don't try looking for it, because you won't find it. So what they talked about with the changes now 
on the new SCAT 5 compared to the SCAT 3 is they made the actual declaration that it takes a minimum of 10 minutes to do this assessment, which again, when you put that out there, that means a lot of implications for sports societies and sports uh, organizations as far as, hey, if I really want to be serious about concussions and the international experts are saying it takes a minimum of 10 minutes to do this assessment and I give anything less than 10 minutes to do that assessment, that's a problem. So we have to think about that. Um, it included an immediate acute assessment section that had indications for emergency management, so it's got specific listing criteria on there. These are things that need to go to the emergency room pronto. Um, it recommended that symptom checklists be done in a resting state by the athlete, so that means we don't do it right after they've stopped their exercise, okay, because they may have more symptoms right after they exercise. We want to do it when they've rested, so you give them five minutes or so to let themselves settle down, let their heart rate settle down. Uh, and get over the, the adrenaline rush of the uh, sport before we actually do their symptom checklist. Um, there's different instructions for completing the symptom checklist at a baseline and then post-injury. So the nice thing about these SCATs is that they've become very dummy proof. They, they basically give you all the words that you tell the athlete or ask the athlete of how you do the assessment and then what each of those assessments you do and how, what you interpret those as. So, so again, it gets very simple, hopefully, to go through at least how you do it to make it in a standardized fashion. So one person isn't asking the question for uh, part of the scat in one way and another person's doing it another way and then you do get two conflicting answers uh, as far as how you do it. So it is different as far as the baseline or post-injury. So post-injury, you're gonna ask that person's symptoms immediately after the event. For the baseline, you're asking them how do they typically do or how have they done over the last 24 hours, okay? So not just right at the time of when they're filling out the checklist. Um, in the um, sideline assessment of concussion, the SAC, there's an immediate and delayed work recall risk. Those of you who have used this recognize that there's always been five words. So as an example, elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble. So that's five of the words that are on one of the assessments. Now they've increased it to 10 words as there's 10 words assessments. There's still the five, but they've added an option for 10. I will tell you this, and this is my big pet peeve with the SCAT assessments with these international guidelines. They put these things in there and there's no research behind it yet. And so they've done this before and they did it with the child and they actually took stuff out of the child because they realized, hey, we've got no, no evidence to support the use of this in kids, is they added 10 words in there, but there's no science or there's no research published out there to show that 10 words is any more beneficial than five. So, more to come, and I don't know, they sometimes throw these things in here so we can spur doing research to add 10 words. You know, it's hard enough for most athletes when we look at the research of, of recalling five words and then doing delayed five words that I don't know how they're gonna do 10, okay? Um, but, but anyhow, it's there now. And then they added more word lists, um, and they said that the, the word lists, when you do a baseline assessment on someone with the SCAT and post-injury, they should be different word lists. So as an example, don't use your same five words all the time, okay? There was a great uh, uh, article about, um, about the former uh, head of the NFL's medical committee, uh, uh, Elliot Pellman, and the Jets players criticizing him that he always used the same words over and over and over again, so they knew what words they were, so it wasn't a big mystery for them as far as what words they were supposed to say back to him when they did an assessment. So, so again, that's out there. So, so again, mix up your words, because athletes learn them. You know, I, I, I give an example sometimes when I do this talk there, the military has the same problems with concussions as we do in sports. And so, so I've done a lot of stuff with the CDC and we are side by side a lot with the military. And so Colonel Dallas Hack was sitting next to me at one of these meetings and he had talked about an example of the, the five words and they were in the military theater, they were assessing a soldier for a concussion and the soldier told them, no, those aren't the five words. And he says, yo, those are your five words. He says, no, those aren't the five words. He had actually had the five words tattooed on his forearm so he could, in the military setting, be able to go back out and fight some more um, if he gave those five words. So, so again, athletes can be savvy about these things. These words are out there. So if athletes really wanted to, they can go and memorize the lists if they want. So I sometimes will throw in a random five words of my own in there um, that they have to go through so they, they can't um, memorize them. Uh, other things is the digits backwards. They now have six versions of the digit string. So again, giving you other number options for them. They added a rapid neurologic screen, so these are the five things that they have you do. Can you, the patient read aloud, so can they actually talk and read? Um, you assess for full, pain-free, passive cervical range of motion, so then uh, are you just being able to, to passively move it in, in a pain-free fashion? So again, looking for that neck injury. Uh, with eye movement alone, can the patient look side to side and up and down without double vision? So this is kind of a, a brief cursory 
ocular motor screen, so can they do that without seeing double? Um, can they do finger to nose normally? And so finger to nose is, you have a finger out there and they have to go back and forth from finger to nose, and can they do that? Um, you, you say, and I had an athletic trainer ask me once, why do you do that on the sidelines? I'm like, well, because I'm actually looking for a neurologic problem that that person may have that's not a concussion. So if they have a concussion, they should be able to do that. If they have something more than a concussion, they might, may not be able to do that. And actually, the two patients that I've had that have had very abnormal tests with that, both had brain tumors. That's the reason why they had their problem. It wasn't their concussion. So, so we look for those things because, again, those may su suggest something more is going on than a concussion. And can they do tandem gait normally? So that's doing heel to toe in a straight line um, going across that. So, again, the, kind of the drunk test, so to speak. Um, so that's that. And they have more detailed instructions in each section. So, like I said, they made it even more idiot-proof as far as, hey, can I read through this and can I just read off the paper and go through it with a patient? So, again, you don't have to remember each of these things. Um, and so, again, you do it in a standardized fashion every time. Uh, the report, turn to sports section emphasizes full physical and cognitive rest should typically only last 24 to 48 hours. So, again, we're not shutting them down completely for extended periods of time. We briefly back off on things, um, and then we increase their activity level and their cognitive activity level shortly after that. And they added a return to school progression that's on there as well, uh, as far as how do we uh, reemphasize getting back into school. And then <clears throat> for the child scat, they made some adjustments there too. So they recommended the 10 to 15 minutes to complete the full assessment. So again, taking a little bit longer. They actually got rid of the Maddox question. So what was referred to in the first talk as far as the child Maddox, there is no such thing. They're gone. Those questions are gone because the research has only been done on adults in that. So they got rid of those because they weren't felt to be valid. Um, they added an overall rating of function for the kid. So how do you feel like you're functioning at a level of 0 to 10? Uh, and for the parent, how you think the kid is functioning from 0 to 100? Um, they got rid of orientation questions, so like where are you, what day of the week, uh, what time is it, those types of things. Um, they added some additional word lists, they added some additional number strings, they added the rapid neurologic screen, they also added the return to school, and it was felt that the child SCAT 5 is really appropriate for the 5 to 12 year old age group. So if you're dealing with high school kids, we just need to deal with the other one, but if you're dealing with any kids younger than that, the child SCAT is, is what's recommended. I personally still can't recommend it just because there still has not been very much research at all looking at the child SCAT 5 and the utility and looking at it in kids in that age group. So there's been very, very limited research on that. Um, so, so again, that's still to me a, a to be continued as far as implementing this on a widespread scale. And that's why when they came out with the first SCAT, child SCAT, they had all these things on there. They just basically did like they do for a lot of things with kids is they make the adult version and make it a little bit easier and hope that the kids can do it, um, but didn't really look to see is that appropriate for that 5 to 12-year-old age group. So, so that's why they removed some things is they realized, oh, we did it wrong. And that, so that's all I have. I did have one little thing up there, just my own little personal plug since I'm here. So, so we do a sports medicine update every year, and so we got one coming up in March. So we'd love to have you there. So, and my email's up there. My Twitter's on there. I'm kind of active on Twitter, so if you, and a lot about concussions, so if you want, feel free to follow me on Twitter. So, thanks. I think we got time for questions.